Jerejev. So, uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, if you remember, for those of you who were here for the first lecture, you remember that from now on, we move to the second uh, aspect, somehow, of my, of my lectures. Until now, I have been questioning the concept of translation as a way of creating equivalence and reciprocity in a situation where you have uh, asymmetry, colonial situation, for example, how within the colonial space, translation, so to say, uh, uh, creates some form of equivalence, etc. So now in the second uh, um, uh, part of my, of my lectures, which means today and next time, I will be considering the relationship within the concept uh, uh, of translation uh, of a sacred language to a profane, non-sacred uh, 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 language. More precisely, uh, my uh, previous lecture last Monday was devoted to the translation of orature into literature and the imperial language. I argued that translating orature, translating one's culture, was a way of creating some form of equivalence within the fundamentally non-equivalent uh, uh, asymmetrical uh, uh, space of colonialism. And uh, if you remember, I ended up uh, my, my lecture, at the end of it, I questioned the very identification of Africa in some general and essentialist way as a civilization of orality. This is something you find sometimes in the literature about Africa being a civilization of orality. Uh, and uh, this is something I want to question. If we agree that a civilization everywhere is a living movement, such a characterization of a civilization as being uh, orality fails in this case to fully comprehend the importance of change and of history. And this characterization would miss in particular the, the importance of the history of written erudition in large regions of the continent with the consequence that the intellectual history of Africa in its complexities and in its diversity is still understudied. I believe with many others that we, have still, we still have work to do in order to give a full account of the intellectual history of Africa as history precisely. To take an example, reflections and debates around the question of African philosophy and the development of African indigenous languages as languages of uh, philosophy have been conducted in almost total ignorance of that history of written erudition. For those of you who might be familiar with the philosophical scene uh, uh, in Africa, Let's say that basically you have had at one point two camps, uh, uh, um, a camp of those who did uh, uh, some philosophical reflection based on uh, ethnographical uh, uh, findings, so to say. You move from ethnographical findings to considerations about the philosophy of the people who are, uh, that you have been uh, um, studying. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a, this ethnological approach, to which you had a very strong opposition of people who just said, this is not philosophy. Philosophy cannot be something collective, doesn't have to do with a, general, a people. Philosophy is an individual activity, and a philosophical system has to be signed by one individual who takes responsibility for that. And the two camps have been throwing hyphens at each other, so to say. Uh, the first have been accused of just being ethno-philosophers, meaning that they pretend to do philosophy, but what they are doing is truly just using ethnology with some philosophical language. Uh, 
and the second have been accused by the former of being Euro philosophers, meaning that they have a narrow, very European conception of philosophy. What interests me is not the terms of the debate, which is now, we, we, we came over that kind of debate. It is just something really passé. It is something that belongs truly to the 70s and the 80s. But what is interesting is that they did not, neither camp just considered the history of written erudition on the African continent. Just go and check what had been not just thought about, but also written as philosophy on the continent. So one of my fields of research is precisely the history of philosophy in Africa in connection with that history of written erudition. I will here limit myself to West Africa, the a region that has been historically known as Sudan. I will come back to that, to that uh, uh, name, which was the first name, the previous name of Mali before Mali became uh, uh, Mali. But the first point here is to be made is that the intellectual history of that region and the history of philosophical thinking in particular is also a history of erudition, which is part of a larger history of transfer and translation of knowledge that is referred to usually with the Latin phrase translatio studi. Uh, it's a very uh, 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 technical uh, word, uh, translatio studi uh, um, in Latin, or you can use the plural instead of using the genitive of studium, which is studi, you could say translatio studiorum. But this Latin phrase is a phrase that was coined during medieval times in Europe to illustrate the transfer of uh, uh, knowledge, translatio meaning transfer, transfer of knowledge, uh, philosophy in particular, but you have to remember that at that time when you say philosophy, it just encompassed every single science. Mathematics was part of philosophy, astronomy was part of philosophy, medical sciences were part of philosophy, so the word philosophy uh, uh, was quite synonymous with knowledge in, uh, in general. So the transfer of knowledge from Greece to Rome and from Rome to the Christian world was what was called translatio uh, uh, studi. Basically, it is meant to claim, it is a claim and a political uh, claim. It is a way of claiming the philosophical heritage and it had, as I said, a very strong uh, political significance. It is interesting to see that the claim was first made when the phrase translatio studi was coined, it was to make the claim as a way of defending and legitimizing uh, 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 Capetian power, the power and the empire of uh, uh, Charlemagne, uh, uh, Carlos Magnus, as the new incarnation of what was transferred from Athens and then Rome. So in order to legitimize the empire of Charlemagne, it was claimed that he was the latest avatar of ancient Greece and then ancient <clears throat> Rome. And then it moved from that political sphere uh, to universities. Uh, 12th, 13th century are the centuries of philosophy, of emergence of uh, universities in, in, in Europe. I had the pleasure of visiting Heidelberg uh, this Saturday with my good friends, uh, Mamadou Jawara, Professor Jawara, and uh, Aise, his, uh, his wife. And I understand that Heidelberg was 12th century? 13th? 13th century. So a little later than Sorbonne in, in France. OK. So uh, France won, Heidelberg zero. Uh, so universities then made uh, that claim, presenting themselves as the end point of the translation. Uh, 
So translations to D was now going from ancient Greece, Athens, let's say, to Rome, and from uh, uh, there to uh, uh, the universities. Thus, the University of Paris uh, considered itself to be the culmination of the journey of knowledge. Now, let me quote uh, philosopher uh, Francis Bacon on that translation studio. Study. This is what Bacon says. God first revealed philosophy to his saints and gave them the laws. It was thus primarily and most completely given in the Hebrew language. It was then renewed in the Greek language primarily by Aristotle. Then in the Arabic language primarily through Avicenna. But it was never composed in Latin and was only translated, transferred, the single word in Latin is translata, so both translated and transferred, based on foreign languages, and the best texts are not translated. End of quote. So this is the quote from Bacon. Now, I made this quote, I gave you this quote to make uh, um, a few remarks. First remark from this quote. Uh, original knowledge is considered sacred. The true original knowledge is the one given by God to his saints or prophets. And Greek philosophy itself is considered to be the result of a transfer from what was revealed by God in Hebrew uh, 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 first. So that would explain somehow why philosophy should not be considered uh, uh, in opposition to religion. After all, the wisdom contained in philosophy, as philosophy, the definition, the etymological definition of philosophy would be the love of wisdom, that particular wisdom has something to do with a philosophical translation of something that was holy and sent by uh, God himself to his saints. So there is something to be learned as uh, uh, Muslim philosophers, in particular Ibn Rushd, as and known by his Latinized name of Averroes, will say, from the wisdom of the ancient philosophers, for those who live in an intellectual universe defined by revelation. Because all three monotheistic re uh, uh, religions actually are going to encounter that problem uh, when they were in contact with Greek philosophy. Why should we be interested in the wisdom of these people who, after all, were just pagan, so had uh, no revelation. So one way from philosophers of looking at that is to say, well, human wisdom, as long as it is wisdom, is some form of reflection or translation of uh, uh, the wisdom sent by God to his uh, saints. That was my first remark. The second remark is that translatio studi, the transfer of knowledge, is also ips, ipso facto a, a, a translation. Uh, if I want to use another Latin phrase, it would be a translatio linguarum, uh, 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 a voyage, so to say, through the languages. And uh, you have remarked that <clears throat> the status of Latin in the code is very interesting here because Hebrew and Arabic are considered to be truly uh, uh, languages of that wisdom, while Latin is just a language that one can use uh, as an instrument. Third remark on the quote is precisely that inclusion of Arabic among the languages of the transfer. The name Avicina, which is a Latinized form of the Arabic name, which is Ibn, Sina, the son of Sina, Avicina, is here very significant. So uh, from the coat of Bacon, we can see that the very notion of translatio studi that I have defined as the transfer of knowledge from Greece to Rome and from Rome to the Christian uh, European world is now complicated. Because if you consider Arabic and if you consider a name such as Avicina, you do not have anymore the linear constructed trajectory 
that goes from ancient Greece to Europe and European universities, you would say that translatio studii actually is not linear, but it has made tours and detours, and it can be demultiplied in different ways. And one such demultiplication of translatio studii that I am interested here could be precisely described as Athens, Baghdad, Timbuktu, instead of Athens, Rome, and Paris, or Heidelberg, or Tübingen. I believe that here we are too young to consider ourselves as part of that translatio studii. Um, so such a description is also a simplification. Even, even the, the, the description I have taken, this other route, uh, going from Athens to Timbuktu via Baghdad, is again a simplification uh, because uh, 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 localities could be inserted between Athens and Baghdad. You could insert uh, other places that are now in uh, Iranian uh, uh, territory that preceded Baghdad. And, uh, 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 and at the same time, Timbuktu itself that I am using here is of course historical Timbuktu in Northern Mali, but it also stands for many uh, uh, localities in Africa that were learned centers for uh, uh, Islamic sciences in general, the, the ulumuddin, the sciences of, of religion in Islam. So what actually is being transferred in the translatio uh, studi? What does the name Avicina stand for uh, 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 here? So I would like to examine in a first moment, in a first uh, uh, movement of my lecture, that first segment, the segment that goes from Athens to Baghdad before I look at the segment that goes from Baghdad to Timbuktu. So on the translatio studi, Athens, Baghdad, I will make the three uh, 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 following points. My first point concerns Baghdad itself and its foundation. Why is Baghdad the, the, the receiver of Greek philosophy? What made it the receiver of Greek philosophy translated into Arabic in the first place? Baghdad and my uh, uh, good friend Homayan Alam just uh, taught me that the word itself, Baghdad, is of Iranian uh, origin, which is not surprising because it was founded by the uh, dynasty of the Abbasids, and the Abbasids were very much connected with uh, 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 Persians. Actually, the move that happened in the, in the Muslim world, the move that was from the dynasty, the first dynasty of the Umayyads, to the Abbasid did correspond to a shift from an Arabic-centered uh, word of Islam, centered around <coughs> Arabs as people and Arabic as language, and the shift was made with the Abbasids towards uh, uh, the people that were not Arab, the Ajami as they were known, in this case, the, uh, uh, the Farsi or the Furchan. So the second uh, uh, Abbasid caliph, uh, Al-Mansur, who succeeded uh, the first one, Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, uh, is the one who adopted Baghdad as the new capital of uh, uh, the Muslim uh, uh, world then. Because prior to that, from 661 to 750, which is the time, the, a little more than one century during which uh, the Muslim world was led by uh, the dynasty of the Umayyads, Damascus had been the capital uh, of uh, that Umayyad di dynasty for historical and also military reasons. The Umayyads were basically uh, military people. They, during their uh, uh, leadership, their, their reign, you had many different wars, and Damascus was a good locality for military uh, uh, reasons uh, um, and for 
these Arab solidarities upon which their power was constructed. So moving the capital to Baghdad uh, uh, after the first Abbasid Caliph was installed in Haran had a huge significance intellectually. In other words, Damascus corresponded to a military capital, so to say, while Baghdad started as an intellectual uh, uh, location. It meant, by its very position, building a bridge between the Arab world and Sassanid uh, 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 culture. It meant also embracing Persian culture. So one aspect of that was the role that Zoroastrian and Sasanian worldview played in the, in the uh, uh, foundation of Baghdad. One aspect of that is astrology, obviously coming more from the Sasanian world. And the second caliph of um, the Abbasid believed in astrology. And Baghdad was founded after many very precise astrological uh, uh, calculation. So this is a city which is uh, uh, really coming from some kind of astrological uh, uh, wisdom of uh, um, that caliph. And it is believed to have been founded on July 30, 762, for those reasons. Now, something that was important also to just think of Baghdad as a place for translation, and that is what I'm interested in, is that it is also the place where the technology of paper was introduced. Something very important, obviously, if you have to be develop as a, an intellectual uh, capital to master the technology of paper, which is said to have been introduced by Chinese prisoners arriving in Baghdad. Anyway. Baghdad became the symbol of openness to translatio, uh, uh, and that is what I'm interested in. And it should be added, by the way, that it was not just Baghdad when we talk about the, 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 the Muslim word, the Islamic word. It was as well southern Spain and the region known as historica as Al-Andalus, because when the Umayyad dynasty uh, came to an end in 750. They were just massacred. In, in, uh, but uh, at that time, southern Spain was part of the Muslim world. And the Umayyad prince that was in uh, southern Spain just separated his land from the rest of the Muslim world and uh, established and continued the rule of his family in Cordoba and from 756, six years after the end of uh, the dynasty of the Umayyad, uh, to the early uh, 11th century, there was an Umayyad caliphate that existed in Cordoba. And Cordoba too meant, just like Baghdad, the development of a scientific and philosophical tradition because Cordoba was trying to emulate precisely what made Baghdad so remarkable, that is to say, the intellectual life uh, there. So Cordoba also became a, a center of translation of Greek knowledge and uh, an end point of the translatio uh, uh, studi. I mentioned the 11th century because after the 11th century, this was much more problematic, the, the, the tradition of Al-Andalus being a very open place uh, started to, to, to faint as uh, the dynasty of the Umayyad there was replaced by the Berbers coming from our regions further south, uh, northern uh, the valley of River Senegal, Morocco, and they swept the whole region and uh, came to Spain, and their rule was much less uh, oriented toward this translatio and this uh, 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 openness, more, uh, more so because even at that time, as early at that time, you already could feel in Spain the pressure of what is going to be the Reconquista. The pressure of the Reconquista would be felt there, and as you know, it will end in 1492 with the expelling of the last uh, uh, Sultan of Cordoba, 
and everybody crossed the Mediterranean and went to northern uh, 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 Africa. So 1492 is not just the discovery of the new world by Mr. Christopher Columbus, it was also the end of Al-Andalus and Muslim rule in southern Spain. That was my first point. My second point is about the translatio linguarum. This is my interest in, in, in these lectures, uh, the translation in languages. The Abbasids, I mentioned that the, 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 the capital, the move of the capital corresponded to some intellectual endeavor to really develop uh, intellectually uh, the Muslim world. The Abbasids favored, the first Abbasids at least, favored translation as a cultural and a social uh, 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 movement, which has been well documented by uh, the scholar Dimitri Gutas and his now classical word, Greek thought, Arabic culture, the Greco-Arabic translation movement in Baghdad and early Abbasid society uh, from the fourth to the 10th century. And this is important because it was truly a movement. The society was a society of translation. And that is uh, uh, very important. You cannot reduce it to just a political decision of, bless you, of translation of Greek philosophy followed by uh, uh, the work of experts. Usually, this has been very much simplified. When people talk about the history of translation of Greek philosophy, there is one date that everybody quotes, which is 832. 832 is when one Abbasid caliph, his name was Al-Mamun. Al-Mamun founded Bayt al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom in, in, in Baghdad. And Bayt al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom, was devoted to translation. He invited there many translators, most of them, by the way, uh, uh, Christian, Nestorian Christians, to translate Greek philosophy into Arabic. And they would translate them from Syriac most of the time. Why Nestorian Christians? Because they already had a, a tradition of translation of Greek philosophy. Because the Christian Nestorians were in theological discussion with other Christian sects, and they needed to use Greek philosophy in their discussion to found and to base their argument on Greek philosophy, especially on logic, the tradition of logic in uh, 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 Greece. So you had many translations uh, uh, already. But beyond that particular point of 832, it was truly a social movement of translation that was taking point. My final and third point is now about language, which is, as you have by now discovered, what I'm interested in. And what I call the becoming philosophical of a language. Translation is the way for a language to become philosophical by receiving uh, the philosophy that is being translated. This happened to Latin. Latin was just a very banal uh, uh, language. Well, banal in the sense that it was not philosophical. You had the eloquence of Cicero, obviously, everything else. But you, for uh, Romans, for many uh, for centuries, philosophy was in Greek. If you wanted to do philosophy, you had to give up your own Roman language, Latin language, and speak uh, Greek. And Cicero, as you know, is the first one who decided that after all, Latin was as worthy as any other language to be the bearer of philosophical thinking. And he is the one who started this movement of translation of Greek uh, philosophy. So this is what I'm interested in and uh, how the Arabic language underwent the same process by which a language is transformed through translation of philosophy and becomes philosophical. I will just give you one single example of a very interesting word, which is the word quiddity. This is total philosophical jargon, the quiddity of one thing. Uh, 
well, it looks very complicated to speak about the quiddity of something until you realize, okay, this is a, an adaptation in English, or in French for that matter, because you say quidite, of the Latin quiditas, which is self, itself is a creation from the Latin word quid. Quid is just what, okay? Uh, quid facis odier, what do you do today? All right, that is something you can ask your, your neighbor. Uh, um, quid, what? Uh, and then from the what, you add the itas that is going to transform it into a substantive. The, the what of the thing, okay? So if I say uh, uh, the, the, the what, the whatity <laughs> of, this, of this battle would be the correspondent of the quiditas. This is how philosophers create these strange uh, words. And I, I believe that as you go to the restaurant Dasein, uh, you have the name of uh, given by someone who was very good at creating all these strange words, which is Mr. Heidegger. So what do Arab translators do? They just take a word that would be the equivalent of that, kefa in Arabic. Kefa, how? Kefa haluka, how are you doing? Okay? Kefa, and then they would use the equivalent in Arabic of itas, and it becomes kefia. The kefia of a thing, the, the essence of that thing, what that thing is intrinsically. Okay? So uh, 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 that's how you, you, you fabricate uh, philosophical concepts. What interests me is the very process by which this language became thus philosophical, but also the resistance coming from the users of the language, in particular the grammarians, who happened also to be theologians, obviously. You can count on grammarians to be really on the fences defending a language. You do not say this, what this does unacceptable, you say like this. So they felt that they were the custodian of the language, adding to that that this was the sacred language of the Quran. What is the matter with these unruly philosophers who are transforming our sacred language into this thing where they would be having words such as kefia or uh, uh, stuff like that? And this was very interesting because the opposition to philosophy coming from the jurisprudence and the grammarians, which was supposed to be a defense of revelation against the rationalist thinking of philosophers, was also a defense of the language in its purity against the hybridity that is introduced by translation. This notion of translation, remember my obsession with Berman's formula, the putting in touch. The translation is what puts languages in touch. And if you put languages in touch, it is like when you put humans in touch, hybridity comes out of it. <laughs> usually, usually, okay? So in this particular case, this is precisely what the opposition was about. It was an, op an opposition to philosophical thinking on religious basis, but it was also an opposition to linguistic transformation from the standpoint of the purity of uh, uh, the language. But still one point, important point was made, which is of great interest uh, to me. There was a famous debate which took place in 938 at the court of the vizier, the Seljukid vizier, who summoned uh, before him a philosopher. His name was Abu Bashir uh, Mata, and a grammarian. His name was Abu Said al-Sirafi. They came and they engaged in some kind of battle, just words, right? But a battle to defend their respective positions. And an aspect of that debate on 
the notion of translation and the purity of the language was that the grammarian said something which is going to be very important later on. The grammarian said to the philosopher, well, listen, here you are so enamored with your Aristotle. You are translating all the works of Aristotle into Arabic. And you are pretending that Aristotle has taught the whole world, has taught humanity what logic is, what sound reasoning is, what the rules of valid reasoning are. Well, I believe that what Aristotle did was not elaborate on the grammar of thought in general, of human thought, but just use the grammar of his own Greek language and pretend that this was universal logic. In other words, you do not have something that you might call universal logic to be found in the works of Aristotle. Each language has its own logic. This very relativist position, which is interesting if you are thinking in terms of translation, okay, how do you move from the logic of a language to the logic of another language, etc., was very interesting because at the time, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we want the philosopher to, to be on the right, uh, to be right and to win the argument because we believe that there is some kind of universality in philosophy and so on and so forth. But the argument made by the grammarian was in fact very modern when you think of it. It was not before the 20th century that a linguist such as Emil Benveniste wrote in 1954 a very interesting and important article entitled Categorie de Langue, Categorie de Pensée, categories, Linguistic Categories and uh, Categories of Thought, in which he said, well, you know, we consider that Aristotle's logic and ontology are universal. That the way in which he says that the categories of being are nine or 10, uh, 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 substance, accident, location, relation, modality, action, passion, etc. all the categories of Aristotle, if you look at them, they are just the way in which in Greek you use the verb to be. So the whole logical construction is heavily dependent on the Greek language itself and the grammar of Greek uh, uh, language. So that is a very interesting point when you look at the translatio studi uh, going from Athens to uh, uh, Baghdad. I'll come back to this aspect of translation, uh, but now I want to go through uh, the translatio studi looking at the segment Baghdad plus Cordoba for the reasons that I have indicated and Timbuktu. Timbuktu stands here for, as a symbol of Islamic West Africa in general. It corresponds, which corresponds to what was called by Arab chronicles, the Bilad Sudan, or just Sudan. Bilad Sudan meant the land of black people. Sudan is the plural of Saud, uh, 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 meaning black. So the Sudan are the black people. This would explain why uh, Sudan in the east is named Sudan, but we did have a Sudan in the west, which was the name of the whole Islamized part of West Africa. And one prerequisite to understand the Sudanic segment of the translatio studi is actually to answer one apparently simple question, what is Africa and what is Sub-Saharan Africa? We assume that Sub-Saharan Africa seems to be a coherence by itself. We assume the division between North Africa and so-called Sub-Saharan Africa, and we even used to call this uh, uh, Maghreb and Black uh, uh, Africa. And in doing so, we are profoundly Hegelian, actually. It is the philosopher Hegel, 
Berliner Hegel, I believe he was Berliner, who in his lectures on the history of philosophy looked at the African continent and decided that Egypt was such a great civilization, it could not possibly belong to this continent. So Egypt was part of Asia in terms of the history of the spirit or the history of philosophy. And then North Africa was by destiny to become a part of Europe through colonization, obviously, was not part of Europe belonging to the EU and sharing in the Euro, but uh, should be a kind of colonial appendix of Europe. And then remained what Hegel called Africa proper. And Africa proper was the rest, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which he considered a dark continent that has never been penetrated by the spirit and that could not be penetrated by the spirit. It was too massive, not enough rivers going into it, not enough sea uh, going into it, and he believed very much in the sea. He uh, probably, now that I live in Germany, because he was missing it in, in many different places, but he did believe that good countries open to the spirit are countries that are penetrated from everywhere by the sea, and he thought that Africa was not uh, in that situation so that Africans would just blossom intellectually if they go out of Africa. Of course, this is the reason why you have so many uh, uh, academics uh, in Germany or in the United States. <laughs> they decide that, forget about the continent. I have to blossom elsewhere, like Hegel announced. So people say that Hegel was racist. In fact, he was not racist. He was geographist. This had nothing to do with race. It had all to do with the geography of the African uh, continent. Well, the point I want to make is that this image of Africa is what prevents us from understanding fully the, what I have called the intellectual history of Africa, of the African continent, and the intellectual history as it is connected to translation. The Sahara has never been the kind of wall separating two words. Sahara has always been a place just with all these many routes, and on those routes you did have goods, you did have people, slaves or free, students and scholars traveling from north to south, etc., etc. Paper, books coming from Spain through Morocco, coming down to places like Timbuktu. So if you do not have that picture of Africa, you cannot reconstruct the intellectual history of Africa. And if you have in mind also the disciplinary divide between Orientalists who would be taking care of anything Islamic, while ethnologists would be taking care of orality, of those societies without writings, then you cannot also reconstruct the whole intellectual history of Africa. So it is the concept of translation and the understanding of the complexities of the intellectual history of Africa commands that we go beyond these disciplinary divides and that we go beyond the fragmentation of the continent between an Africa proper and uh, uh, the rest of it. And to fully understand the Islamization of Africa would be just uh, 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 that to understand that that Islamization meant also the history of African philosophical thinking and writing. The work of British, who became American scholar, John Hanwick and Sean Rex Ofahe, writing these important volumes of Arabic literature of Africa, uh, uh, have been pioneers in this field of reconstructing the intellectual history of Africa. I'm taking this opportunity to just salute the memory of John Hanwick, who was a friend of mine, and who is the one, one among the people who uh, hosted me, uh, welcomed me and hosted me in, in Northwestern Chicago when I went there. And John just passed away uh, a couple of, of, of weeks uh, uh, ago. So that work had, been, had come to an end, but uh, it has been a great work that he did. He was a 
uh, honorary citizen of the city of Timbuktu, and he, he, he spent his life going there looking at manuscripts written in, not only in Arabic, but also in indigenous languages using the Arabic uh, uh, script. Uh, following uh, the work of John Hanwick, my colleague and, and compatriot and friend, Usman Khan, also uh, has written very important uh, work on non-European, inter non-Europhone intellectuals, intellectuals who did write, but did not write in European languages, who used the Arabic script to write in their own uh, languages, or who used, uh, who wrote in Arabic. Uh, with my colleague, Shamil, Jeppi from South Africa, uh, we have published a few years ago uh, a volume devoted to the manuscripts of Timbuktu and other places. Timbuktu, again, is just a symbol for many different places of uh, learning in, in, in West Africa. And that book we wrote, entitled in English, we wrote it in English first, well, we collected uh, works in English under the title uh, the meanings of Timbuktu has been translated precisely by Usman Khan as Tombuktu with a subtitle in French, Pour une histoire de l'érudition en Afrique, which means literally Timbuktu towards a history of erudition in West uh, uh, Africa. This is important because again, it is a way of showing that Africa is not married with orality and to talk about it as a civilization of orality does, is meaningless because a civilization goes throughout history. You are oral at one point, you cease to be oral at another point, and you never cease to be oral. Even civilizations where writing is pervasive have uh, uh, spheres and areas of orality. Orality is just something of an anthropological uh, truth. And this is how one writes the history of African philosophy. Not just looking at this debate between Europe philosophers and ethno philosophers, but also looking at the reality of this history of written erudition, which is a history of translation. Now, it is not just translation from Greek to Arabic and the circulation of a literature in Arabic. Because whether it is commenting orally the books they were reading in Timbuktu, in Jene, in Koki, and in other places, or using Arabic script writing in their own languages, these African languages have already an old tradition of creating these philosophical concepts the equivalent in the languages of the example I gave you when I mentioned quiditas or kefir. So the, not, it's not only for the interest of history, but really for the interest of the future. The future of making African languages, languages of philosophy, languages of literature, and languages of science, because no people can just accept the idea that they are going to do philosophy and science and literature in another language than their own. So the future would be a future of translation on this continent, and that future of translation needs to be connected with this intellectual history that I have tried to describe, which led the Translatio Studi really from Athens to Baghdad, to Baghdad to Cordoba, to Cordoba to Fez, refers to Timbuktu or Gao or Jenny or Koki. Thank you very much for your patience.